Why is it, do you think, that much of, particularly in Australia, we've seen the row over the Ramsey Centre? And I have mm. to say, many of the universities, ex, you know, process stations that will interfere with their independence and so forth, mm. don't sound very convincing to me. Sure. I mean, you really get the impression that they don't want sort of classic history, the yes. great canon yes. taught. Yes. We seem to loathe our own cultural underpinnings. We mm. don't want to teach them. We only want them disparaged. Yes. Yeah, so that's... That's a really important question, I think, for our civilization. Um, there was a shift in the 1960s and, 19, and the 1970s, um, thanks to the influence of the Frankfurt School. Right. So uh, uh, theorists such as Marcuse, Adorno, um, Horkheimer, a bunch of other guys, and then started uh, in Germany in the 1920s. Well, the yeah, school. and then they moved to America during mm. the period of the war. Yeah. And their theory, the critical theory is not, I mean, it's not a bad theory in small doses. And it, it's simply this idea that um, uh, it's not enough to understand how society works. One has to also try and change it. it it's not such a, a bad concept in small doses, but the problem we have today is that entire university departments are dominated by this theory. And then when you bring in the French uh, philosophers such as Foucault, who question the very um, concept of truth, um, you get uh, academics and entire um, traditions within certain um, fields where the very foundations of our civilization are, are questioned and undermined. So what you'll find in, um, I mean, there are of course history departments which are still doing empirical history and are used, bringing in data and doing all sorts of solid work. But we've also got a situation where there are very strong dominant narratives which say that Western civilization is inherently exploitative. It's um, ransacked other cultures in Africa and, and in the East. Um, everything about our civilization has harmed other peoples, indigenous peoples. There's actually, uh, there's no pride or um, recognition of any of the achievements that we've made, that Western civilization has made. And so we're getting an, an entire generation of young people um, coming out with this very distorted view of history and who are seeing their own society and their own history in a very negative light. And I don't think that is healthy at all for a civilization. Surely it's important to remember that the Frankfurt School and from the 1920s and in fact the Italian Gramsci as well, mm. who was writing in the 1930s, one time friend of Mussolini falls out, goes to prison, dies, his works are largely forgotten, but then they're discovered again in the unhappy and turbulent 60s. In many ways, they were motivated by a frustration that the workers had not arisen and overthrown Western capitalism and yes. installed communism. Yes. If the workers weren't going to do it, then perhaps it should be done through academia and yes. reaching the young people. Mm. Under, if you like, that's where the term, I think, cultural Marxism probably comes from. Attack mm. the culture. Ensure that it's no longer seen as worthy as having delivered good you know, no one would ever say it was perfect, but I mean, I wonder whether any cultures have ever really developed personal freedom in the way that the West has. Yeah. And yet our young people are being subjected because it filters out of the universities into academia, into uh, the, the teaching professions, into the media, now into the boardrooms. Um, I wonder whether, or in fact, it equips people to form balanced perspectives yes. on what works and what doesn't work. Yes. Yeah, so my... The, the thing that frightens me the most about critical theory, which has become this dominant explanatory theory within a great portion of academia, is that it doesn't allow for neutrality or impartiality. Yeah. So it forces, when you say it's not enough to understand the world, the point is to change it, it forces one to take a position, take to, take, to pick a side. And then what happens is when academics are advocates or activists, um, they see people who are trying to remain impartial or neutral as the enemy. They haven't picked a side, they're fence sitters, they're the enemy. 
And so it's really frightening because unless we have a space where one can be apolitical or neutral or impartial, we lose our ability to analyze things objectively. We lose the ability to have fair procedures. I mean, imagine the court system, the justice system, if we all just had to pick a side without understanding the evidence. You know, imagine being a person on yeah. a jury and you haven't even looked at the evidence, but you've got to decide whether someone's guilty or not guilty. I mean, we'd be living in the dark ages again. But this is what this theory is doing. And we're training the younger generations to think in this way, which is what scares me the most. Well, I agree. Although there's cause for great hope. Yeah. Uh, there's an enormous appetite amongst younger people. Yes. I think for, for ideas, for being able to explore these things properly. A young Australian said to me the other day, very, very bright young man, and he was at one of our best recognised universities studying commerce and law, and he just said to me, 80% of the people in my classes believe they're fed a lot of ideologically driven stuff that does not bear examination, yep. but they play the game to get through. Sure, yeah. If I were an academic hearing that and I was concerned for decency and objectivity and professional integrity, I'd be concerned. Yeah. No, I think that the universities are not doing themselves any favours because there, there will be, there will, they will reach a tipping point where enough people are disillusioned and alienated and dissatisfied um, to, and, and they will politicise them so politicize themselves so much that um, they'll lose funding because I mean the the institution of the university gets its prestige and its authority and its funding on the premise that they're seeking truth and they're providing accurate knowledge and um, the taxpayers money is not going to waste if they continue down the path that they are on at the moment the public will get fed up and their their funding will dry out Potentially. Um, I think one of the great problems in Australia has been the breakdown of trust in our institutions. Up until now, our universities have remained, remained quite trusted. Yes. But I think they're on thin ice. I think there's an, a, an emerging awareness that in many ways they're not committed to equipping the next generation properly uh, and in a challenging way. Do you think we've got the disease as badly in Australia as they've got in Europe and America or...? Uh, not think, as badly? How do you think we rate? I don't think it's quite as bad. Um, and there are, we have a few protective factors in Australia, such as um, the universities being quite uh, open and egalitarian. We don't have this system of having the Ivy Leagues where people have to pay an arm and a leg just to get in. And then the students have extraordinary powers to sort of get professors fired because they're paying so much money and the administration needs to, you know, keep the customer happy. We're sort of protected in a way um, from some of the student, the crazy, the crazy protest, student protests that we've seen in America. I think certainly some disciplines and some departments have been completely corrupted, but the university itself is probably in, in not a dire situation. And um, I think... I think we can, you know, it's, it's not so bad that things can't be reformed. Um, but when my children are older, I will definitely advise them to avoid certain subjects because yes. they're just a waste of time. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about our national broadcaster. It claims it's politically neutral. Yeah. They've just undertaken a major exercise talking to Australians about what they want and they come back and they've said, well, Australians don't want to talk about politics as much. But I noticed nearly all of the people that they've got now that they've set up to run their new programs in light of that information are left of centre, really. They, they, they seem to be a conservative free zone by and large. Yeah. Uh, and yet they're paid to reflect, I think, a diversity of views, a genuine diversity of views. Mm. How, do, how do you get on with the ABC? How do you see their... Well, I'm not as critical of the ABC as some... People, but I, I know I definitely notice what you describe uh, diversity, but lack of diversity. What I think the ABC needs to do is get more um, people from different socioeconomic backgrounds in. So having diversity of class, 
having more um, perspectives from rural rural yeah. Australia. Yeah. Um, I think I, I see a bubble and it's an urban middle class bubble being represented most on the ABC. Now, maybe that's their viewers, um, but they, they're meant to be representing all of Australia. So we really yeah. need a little bit more diversity. They do get a lot of our money to do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. And, that, and that's the thing. If you don't have class diversity and if, you, if you're only drawing from an urban population, it will be predominantly left wing because the urban middle class is left wing. That's just how it is today. Um, whereas work, uh, more working class people have sort of shifted more to the right. We've seen this great realignment. And so, yeah, and it really is the responsibility of institutions like the ABC to not alienate people, rural Australians and working class Australians and conservative Australians and bringing everyone in together to have a conversation. And they should be able to do that. Thank you for watching this episode. We appreciate your support. If you value vital conversations like this one, be sure to subscribe to the channel there and also click the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases.